Chemical reactions are a very important topic in chemistry. Typically, chemists are really interested in understanding everything they can about a chemical reaction. Um, in this class, we're actually going to cover a lot of things about reactions, and we're going to address these three questions listed here. Will the reaction occur? And if it does occur, will the reaction reach completion? And lastly, how quickly or slowly does the reaction happen? So in this semester, we're actually going to address these questions in this order. So the first question, will it occur, is a matter of energy. And that's called thermodynamics, which will be covered in chapter 20. Well, the reaction reach completion is about chemical equilibria. And we're going to discuss different kinds of chemical equilibria from chapter 17 through 19. And the last question is the topic of our current chapter, kinetics. So within kinetics, we're going to have a few different subtopics. We're going to begin this chapter talking about what a reaction rate is, which is the speed of the reaction and how to measure it. We're going to go over both intrinsic and extrinsic factors that influence the reaction rate. And hopefully by studying kinetics, we can understand something about how the reaction occurs. Um, and lastly, we can add a catalyst to reactions to help them go even faster. So here's an example of a chemical reaction. We have a balanced equation here where our reactants are nitrogen dioxide and carbon monoxide, and our products are nitric oxide and carbon dioxide. And I've shown you some of the Lewis structures uh, down here. And you'll notice that both, nitric, um, both nitrogen dioxide and nitric oxide are actually nitrogen radicals. So you would have learned how to balance chemical reactions before, but maybe you've also wondered about how the reaction happens. Um, so here's another rendition of reactants entering this black box and exiting as our products. And the question is, what really goes on inside? How do these, how do these two reactant molecules actually transform ultimately into the products? I'll make an analogy here. This is kind of similar to, um, instead of a chemical reaction, a bake, where your input are ingredients with the proper stoichiometry, um, and your output would be this delicious cake here on the right. And the black box is not so much a black box um, in a bake, because we know that we are, typically when we bake, we have a recipe. Um, it's typically a sequence of steps, what to do first, what to do next, and also some external things such as the baking temperature. And maybe the reason we want to understand how this bake happens is because we want to apply that knowledge and we want to make other awesome cakes like these delicious ones shown below um, by applying that knowledge and tweaking it and making even more beautiful bakes. So a reaction is very similar. Sometimes we want to understand a chemical reaction fundamentally, um, but also then that we can use that knowledge to apply it. So our ingredients are our reactants and the products. And here, um, instead of a recipe, in chemistry, we call this a mechanism. It's a sequence of elementary reactions. And our inputs, could also be temperature of the reaction and also whether we've added a catalyst or not. So an early theory about chemical reactivity was called collision theory, and this was developed as early as 1916. And there's a few different things about how collision theory works. In collision theory, a chemical reaction is really a successful collision of reactant molecules. And all chemical reactions have an intrinsic energy barrier, 
and for a reaction to be successful, the reactor molecules must collide with a great enough energy to overcome this intrinsic barrier, which we'll, we'll refer to as the activation energy. And lastly, the speed of the chemical reaction or the rate of the chemical reaction is a matter of how often a collision occurs or collision frequency. To make another analogy here, um, this time between collision theory and soccer. Uh, so here we have this famous soccer player, Ronaldo, about to kick the ball into the goal. And you can imagine that the soccer ball and his foot are the two reactants of this reaction. And when they collide, the energy of that collision is called the collision energy, which has to be as great or greater as the activation energy. That would be the intrinsic barrier for the reaction to occur. So now two things could happen um, after collision. If the soccer goes into the net and we have a goal, that would be a successful reaction. So the reactant will turn into product. On the other hand, let's say the collision energy was too low, or perhaps the orientation of the collision was bad and the ball ends up going wide um, and missing the goal. Uh, this can also happen. Not all collisions are successful. Uh, so to come back to collision energy, um, for a chemical reaction to occur, that collision of reactor molecule first has an energy requirement. Collision energy must be greater or equal to the activation energy. Uh, but it also requires that the reactants, when they collide, have the proper orientation. So the reaction rate then um, in this theory is very much directly proportional to how often a collision occurs or collision frequency. Um, you can think about this back to soccer. If you have more chances at the goal, you're more likely to score a goal. So here, the reaction rate will be directly proportional to how often a collision happens. So there's four factors that control the rate of a reaction. They're listed here. The concentration of the reactant molecules, the physical state of the reactant molecules, and then things like temperature and catalyst. So the concentration is important because if you have higher concentrations, you have higher collision frequency, which means you will have a higher rate. But the physical state or the reactant phase and surface area are also important because it may affect their ability um, to mix and to collide. And temperature and catalysts are also important. Temperature actually has two roles in collision theory. One, if you raise the temperature, you can increase the collision frequency because in general, molecules move faster at higher temperature. And then that has a benefit to increasing the rate. Um, but if you also increase temperature, you also increase the energy of the collision and so that means then coming back to having a great enough collision energy to make a reaction, that's also beneficial and that should also increase the rate. Now, the way a catalyst works is very um, different and unique from these other factors in that it actually has the ability to lower the intrinsic energy barrier of a reaction. So it, the way a catalyst works is to lower the activation energy. So we'll start by asking, what is the speed of the reaction or the reaction rate? In the picture shown here, this is reactant A changing into product B. And these beakers 
are basically time snapshots of the reaction. So at time equals to zero, or Ti for initial time, we only have reactants. But at time final, we only have product B. So before we define reaction rate, probably it's first important to understand how do you measure the reaction rate. And if you ask what are the observables, um, we have basically the ability to follow this reaction by following the concentration of reactant A and also the concentration of product B uh, with respect to time. So those are our parameters. And just to remind you that concentration is indicated by these brackets. Uh, so here, bracket A means concentration of A. So reaction rate is defined as the change in concentration of a reactant or product per unit time. And typically, chemical reactions are quite fast. So usually, the unit time is seconds. And the numerator is concentration per second. So here, mole over liters is typically the units for concentration. So you can think of the rate of this reaction as the final concentration of product B minus its initial over in the total time, or T final minus TI, initial time. And that's also equal to following the concentration of A, except because A is disappearing, we have a minus sign out here. So the final concentration of A minus its initial concentration over all time. And this would give us one estimate of rate. Now let's say I wasn't interested in waiting all that time for the reaction to fully complete, but I can still measure the reaction rate in smaller intervals of time, indicated by these blue arrows up here, um, where delta t represents an interval of time, and this would be the first interval, second, third, etc. So we can now define rate as average rate. So this is still the change in concentration of B over the change in time, but now it's for a smaller time period. And again, that's still equal to the negative of the concentration of A over the, concentr over the change in time. So here's a plot that shows the concentration of both A and B here on the y-axis with respect to time on the x-axis. And A starts off full and rapidly decays to zero, while product B starts at zero but rapidly grows in um, to full concentration. Now this plot is also good for showing average rate. So if average rate is just change in concentration over change in time, then we can think about the first time interval, delta T1, um, and the change in concentration in B from zero to this value would be represented by this green arrow, and that would be delta concentration of B. And so the rate is actually represented by this third line, or the slope of this black line, and the steepness of this line represents how fast. And so you can see in the first time interval, the average rate is actually quite steep. But at later time intervals, like this one here, or towards the end of the reaction, the average rate is decreased. And so one important thing about average rate is that it changes with time. And you can find the average rate by looking at the slope of the concentration curve between two time points. And again, the steeper that slope is, the faster the rate. Now, because in this reaction, 1A turns into 1B, so the coefficients of the chemical re reaction are all ones, 
what that means then is that the change in b in this first time interval is equal but opposite to the change in a represented by this dashed line. And so, okay, another kind of rate um, for an even smaller amount of time is called the instantaneous rate. So these are the same equations for average rate, but now the delta is replaced by this little d, and d is very, very, very small. So it's such a small uh, change um, in time and change in concentration. Now, in the plot, you can also represent this by looking at the blue line. So instantaneous rate here by the blue line, and I kept one of the average rates here in the gray line. So the average rate was the slope of the gray line, uh, which was the change of B in this time interval from 20 seconds to 30 seconds. But if you just wanted to know the rate at 30 seconds, that would be represented by this blue line, which is perfectly tangent to the curve at t equals 30 seconds. So an instantaneous rate basically gives you the rate at a particular instant in time. And it is the slope of the line that's tangent to the curve. And just like average rate, the instantaneous rate changes with respect to time. And so all these lines here, the red, orange, yellow, and blue, they are all representative of instantaneous rates. And they are all tangents uh, to the curve at different time points. Now, one special one is what happens at t equals zero. That would be this red line here. Um, this instantaneous rate is called initial rate because it happens at initial time. We're going to show how reaction rate actually for the same reaction can vary depending whether you're asking it for a particular reactant or a particular product. So up until now, we dealt with more simple um, reactions like this first one up here. One molecule of A turns into one molecule of D. And we see that the rate of D formation is equal and opposite to the disappearance of A. Um, now, this, is, this direct equality is really because this is a one-to-one -one relationship in the chemical reaction. But let's make it a little bit more difficult, and here one molecule of A becomes two molecules of C. Now, as every molecule of A disappears, two molecules of C form. So you can see that the formation of C is not going to equal magnitude the disappearance of A but rather the formation of C is going to be twice um, as fast as the disappearance of A. So this too comes from the fact that it's a one to two relationship. And another way to think about this is that the disappearance of A is the formation of C divided by T. And so a useful general relationship is for any balanced chemical equation, A and B, giving C and D, where the little a, B, C, and D represent the stoichiometry of the reaction, you can write that the rate is equal to the formation of the products divided by their coefficients. Um, and that's equal to the rate of disappearance of the reactants. So the reactants have negative signs here, but they're also divided by their coefficients. And so it's important to remember that unless coefficients in the balanced equation are all one, when we ask about the rate of a reaction, it might actually depend on exactly which reactant or which product we're asking about.